I've really been looking forward to uh, this afternoon, and thank you very much for the invitation to to join you this afternoon. Um, yes, I, uh, I appreciate there's a, a quite a broad uh, diversity in the audience potentially uh, this afternoon, and uh, therefore a, a broad diversity of interests. So uh, I hope this talk um, can provide something of of interest and of use for everybody listening. I've decided to concentrate on road verges uh, and public urban spaces with a focus on cost-effective green space innovation for wildflower and pollinator benefit. So um, I'll move uh, forwards in the presentation uh, and start by uh, setting some context by highlighting uh, that in England, the 25-year environment plan set by DEFRA uh, uh, that that um, sets big aims, including the creation of a nature recovery network. A parallel document relative to uh, relevant to Scotland is a nature recovery plan that's been published by uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, RSPB Scotland, uh, and uh, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, which refers to a similar concept and calls it nature networks. Now. These concepts are underpinned by landscape ecology and look at trying to reduce the fragmentation of our natural and semi-natural habitat and increase its connectivity, the amount of it, its quality and how joined up it is on a landscape scale. So that as a wildlife trust uh, in Lincolnshire, uh, where I'm a conservation officer, if we look uh, at our land holdings uh, across our county, then on the right hand side, uh, we'd be wasting a vital opportunity for wildlife if we were just to view these as museum exhibits. Whereas instead, uh, if we were to allow um, these this wildlife to come out from under its bell jar and to disperse itself, firstly, um, from between arterial, uh, uh, along arterial corridors between these vital living organs in a living landscape, then we'd be looking at a, a network that was much more robust and resilient for the future recovery of nature. Better able to supply itself, these nature reserves to supply one another with wildlife, they'd then be in a, a better health, state of health, to radiate out wildlife at a landscape scale. So that could be achieved, that connectivity could be created by the creation of stepping stones or indeed continuous, contiguous corridors which can be the linear green infrastructure we see almost as the stitch work in the patchwork of our of our landscapes. They can be, as you see on the left hand side there, field margins or hedgerows or even the green spaces that flank our transport corridors and that includes road verges. When we think of road verges then we, we tend to think of the negative effects that roads have such as the habitat loss when they're constructed the pollution and the disturbance caused by their use, the mortality caused by collisions of both vertebrates and invertebrates, and, and then the barrier effects they have, the, the barriers they constitute to the dispersal of wildlife across our landscape. But we have to live with them, we need them, uh, and the road verges either side of our road verge network can provide ecosystem services, and they can also act both as refuges and corridors for wildlife too. It does depend, of course, what backdrop you have to start with. So roads running through a landscape with a high background biodiversity could be seen as having a net negative effect or the black lines on a green background, to put it crudely, on the left. But in a county much like the one I'm in here in Lincolnshire, this is intensely cultivated uh, lowland where quite often road verges turn out to be uh, the last stand for our native flora and the fauna that supports. There's about 200,000 or just over hectares of road verge area when we take England, Scotland and Wales together. And that amounts to a fair chunk of land. In fact, it's the size of Nottinghamshire, almost an English county hidden in plain sight. And of that, five to six percent is constituted by motorways amounting to just over 11,000 hectares. 
so it's no insignificant tract of land. This, uh, these charts try to show the uh, relative um, breakdown of uh, different road types as part of the whole. And the greys represent rural roads, the oranges represent urban roads, and the lighter colours represent minor roads, so that the uh, across England, Scotland and Wales at the top, you see the light grey minor rural roads can account for nearly half of all the road verge network. That has big implications for biodiversity opportunity for local authorities in rural areas and possibly in forming partnerships with adjacent landowners where they may currently be managing those road verges and could manage them better for wildlife. And in addition, with uh, forthcoming new agri-environment schemes, there may be incentives to buffer good quality road verges for wildlife by instating the right kind of um, field margin alongside them. The large slice of, of, of pale orange there represents the uh, inner urban minor roads and where they have verges that can represent a very substantial part of our urban green space and an opportunity for wildlife and people as a result. So the chart at the bottom there shows that in more rural counties, such as uh, in the area of Greater Lincolnshire, the minor rural uh, roads can, can constitute nearly two thirds and rural roads as a whole can uh, account for over three quarters of the road network. And that has implications uh, for slides to come. You could ask though, what have road verges ever done for us and for wildlife for that matter? Well, um, well-managed biodiverse verges can provide ecosystem services such as they can support the pollination of neighbouring arable crops. Uh, and in total uh, across the UK, that's worth over half a billion annually, according to DEFRA. That's because they host our native wildflowers, which provide the continuity and a diversity of nectar and pollen supply that crop plants, of course, can't. They can also, verges can also act as reservoirs for friends of our, our crops. So they act as sanctuaries for predators and parasitoids of crop pests and can contribute to the regulation of, of pest uh, populations. We can also look to improve the safety of the pullover zone when we're driving and visibility along roads on approach to junctions and tight bends. When we buffer the fertility from adjacent field inputs by allowing hedgerows to grow and by collecting biomass or grass cuttings when we mow. By removing that biomass, we remove fertility in that growing material and that leads to a lower growth height at the road edge. Also, work in northwest France has found that you can improve water quality. You can reduce nitrates in the drainage water by removing vegetation cuttings rather than allowing them to rot down into drain, drains and ditches. You'll be able to mitigate the effects of crosswinds and, and, and snow drifting if you allow roadside trees and hedgerows to act as wind breaks in those more exposed areas. And within the urban environment, you can increase levels of oxygen decrease the, the temperature to reduce heat island effects, reduce those driver stress levels, noise levels can come down, you can increase shade where you need it, and you, you can improve air quality by redirecting and absorbing particulates in the air. Of course, you can also start to capture and sequester carbon. If we cut a slice through uh, a, a road and its neighbouring road verge, then that kind of cross section shows that a road verge is generally made up of a, a series of parallel stripes of different habitat type. And right next to the carriageway will be, of course, the most disturbed and compacted soil, quite often dusted with salt on gritted roots. But then in the middle of the verge, you'll find a grassland assemblage, which has every opportunity to be a wildflower and invertebrate rich meadow habitat. That can sometimes be flanked by uh, aquatic habitat, which can support uh, marginal and aquatic flora and fauna, and that can be accompanied, of course, by shrubs, uh, semi-mature and mature trees in the hedgerow boundary. There's often a bit of debate about who's responsible for what in the road environment and on its verges, but very much more often than not, it's generally true to say that it's uh, the 
uh, responsibility of the adjacent landowner to maintain the roadside hedges and trees and to maintain the uh, roadside ditches, whether they're open or piped. It's the highways authority uh, who are responsible for the verges and for those transverse drains or grips that drain the carriageway across the verge. It's only when there's a, a modern road build, uh, which as part of the construction builds its own drainage system, that the highways authority is then uh, responsible for maintaining the drainage infrastructure as well as the road verge. So firstly, hedgerows. How can we manage them best of all for uh, wildflowers and invertebrate wildlife? Well, if it's been found, if you reduce the cutting or trimming frequency from once every year to once every three years, you will enjoy more than doubling in a, in a number of flowers and you'll more than triple the mass of berries that are produced. So you'll feed your pollinators far better and provide winter fruit for winter birds. Uh, and in addition to helping moths, we can also um, help our uh, winter birds uh, by maximizing uh, the amount of time we give them to feed from hedgerows. And it's been found that um, if hedgerows are uh, foraged um, by mid-January, they're generally foraged by mid-January, so you can, you can time your cut for after that point. So the general message we can conclude about hedgerow management on roadsides is that um, if you cut less often and later, then wildlife will benefit in a number of ways. When it comes to ditch management, then in order to least disturb in amphibians, water voles if they're present, plants and invertebrates, it's best to aim as closely as you can for late October before the winter flows really start to increase and to avoid leaving the ditch spoil uh, and the cut vegetation on the verge for all the reasons associated with fertility, which works against biodiversity, as Phil has explained. But it's really that central wildflower meadow potential that uh, represents the largest, the greatest uh, conservation interest, because very often it's the final redoubt for our national wildflowers. Over 700 species of wildflowers grow on verges, and that is nearly 45% of our total flora, including 87 species that are threatened with extinction. So with over 500,000 kilometres of UK rural road, that hosts uh, an equal amount of verge area to the, to the area, uh, to half the area of our remaining flower rich grasslands and, and meadows. And with over 97% of wildflower meadows lost since the 1930s, the area collectively that road verges represent are a, a hugely significant um, refuge for wildlife, especially for grassland wildlife. Not only for plants, but road verges can act as pollinator sanctuaries too. So a study in Devon and Cornwall by Plymouth University in 2014 found that there were twice as many bumblebees on the roadsides than there were the other side of the hedgerow on the field margins, and that the species number and abundance of the flowers used by bumblebees was again higher on the roadside rather than on the field side. So that strongly suggests that um, the that strongly suggests that the um, uh, the road verges could be used for uh, pollinator conservation. And we don't need any further proof really of the potential ecological corridor effect of road verges when we look at some of the distribution maps in the early 80s in this case of coastal species which uh, are associated with salty environments. This is a distribution map that traces the roots of the A1 and the M1 and it's a salt marsh grass and after this species colonized these uh, gritted roots uh, it was followed by a number of other maritime species uh, and it clearly um, these species have been able to disperse themselves along our transport corridors. So what are we getting wrong with uh, our road verge management and its grassland? It's fair to say that generally speaking to bring the most biodiversity out of a grassland system, 
you're best trying to imitate the action of wild grazing as closely as possible. And departing from that will lead to a loss of biodiversity. So problems often arise by either cutting too frequently or too infrequently. Too many cuts lead to a lack of flowering and a lack of seed production, which can work against both the plants and the invertebrates. Then if there are no cuts at all, that leads to a process known as vegetation succession, which means that gradually the more competitive species start to outcompete the less competitive species, leading to the formation of first tussocks, then the encroachment of scrub, and finally the establishment of trees and their shade. So cutting more than twice a year, and or not cutting at all, can be negative for our roadside grassland. And when we cut, as Phil explained, leaving a, a smothering mulch of cuttings will provide a will present a, a, a physical impediment to any uh, any growth that wants to push through it meaning that only the most vigorous minority of species will be able to survive leading to a, a loss of biodiversity so we must collect our cuttings and the accumulation of fertility is also really important to consider we'll see the tall growth of tall herbs like nettles, hogweed and thistles in fertile ground and they're dangerous for visibility and although these species are vital for our ecosystem they would normally only occur in abundance in naturally fertile locations like river floodplains. Now if we continue to leave our cuttings to rot down into the soil and we allow the diffusion of farming inputs to affect our soil, if we uh, clear ditches and leave the, the, the fertile sediment on our road verges uh, with the constant uh, nitrogen rich vehicle emissions from passing traffic. All of this leads to accumulating fertility. So clearing cuttings is a very important way to counteract that uh, otherwise accumulating level of unnatural levels of fertility. In Lincolnshire, we have a network of roadside nature reserves and we cut and collect hay with subcontractors and also by working in partnership with local farmers. The local highways authority gives us a budget of what amounts to about 150 pounds per kilometre of designated road verge, but we would ideally need more than that budget provided for optimal management. It's supplemented to a small degree by what Natural England can provide for the legally protected verges, but generally speaking, we make hay between mid-July and the end of September and follow up with a flail in the autumn. And that has the effect of maintaining uh, what you see down there uh, as a carpet of orchids on one of our best roadside nature reserves in the Lincolnshire walls. So this is our heavy infantry, if you like, our suite of pedestrian single axle machines, which we use to maintain the less accessible verges. They have a, a range of interchangeable working attachments and you'll see in the foreground there a cutter bar power side, behind that a flail head, and then to the left a younger version of me sporting the Cave Mountain Press mini baler. Here's the uh, power side in action, and you can see that it could be fitted with additional wheels to increase stability on slopes. The cutter bar will generate a long strand cut which can be baled uh, and removed from sight. But the cutter bar can be subject to breakages uh, and consequently some downtime. So for a more robust working head, we also have flail heads, which are less susceptible to breakage, but of course generate a short strand cut that can't be bailed. Nevertheless, a belt driven side delivery power rake can be used to row up and create windrows of long strand cuts before that's then incorporated into bales. Uh, it can also be used if there are no other disposal options to move the short strand cuttings into a hedgerow base, provided that hedgerow base is already very fertile, full of tall herbs, um, and uh, provided it's not showing the evidence that it's a, a vestigial ancient woodland edge. The mini baler, we'd say, uh, can suffer downtime if you try to use it uh, on the large scale. So it's really uh, suited to the most sensitive sites with the, the, the hardest access. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the full um, kit 
from baler, flail, cutter bars and, um, uh, 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 and power rakes can all be fitted onto, transported in a 14 foot flatbed trailer, which can be stored securely in what you see there, uh, an insulated uh, 20 foot marine shipping container. We've had the opportunity to compare the working rates of our single axle machines with low end compact tractor equipment. And we found that generally the compact tractors and their attachments are twice as efficient as the single axle machines. Although you can close that gap by increasing uh, the number of people working with the single axle machine to groups of two or three. However, we'd say that um, from our experience, the best approach is a hybrid approach whereby you, you use progressively large equipment, uh, larger equipment to, um, to work on the increasingly accessible verges, saving the smaller kit to, for the, um, the, the work on the, the, the least accessible verges. Um, but all the time trying to minimize the size of the kit and minimize the, um, the ground pressure in each case. These numbers shown here are hoovered up from the internet uh, uh, just to give some ballpark recommended uh, retail uh, prices for, um, for single axle machines across a range of brands uh, compared uh, to the compact tractor kit at its lowest end. And no brands are recommended over any other. Instead, at the bottom of the screen there, what I've tried to do is uh, suggest a range of cost for the single axle suite of equipment with attachments, which could set you back between 11 to 28,000 uh, pounds compared to the low end of a compact tractor suite between 12 and 21,000. And that doesn't factor in uh, spare attachments, which you could also invest in to minimize your downtime with any breakages. Haymaking is expensive, it's labor intensive, it's time consuming, and it's incredibly dependent on the weather. So could suction flail biomass harvesting with anaerobic digestion of the cuttings be a good enough substitute for the ecological activity of some of our primordial grazing herbivores now consigned to the fossil record? There are of course pros and cons to suction harvesting. First of all, the do nothing scenario uh, would continue to see the loss of road verge grassland diversity for the reasons already given. There are potential benefits, however, and we could look to improve ecosystem service, namely pollination and biodiversity, among others already listed. Um, we could also try to deliver uh, against policy targets. So here in England, um, favourable condition must be met and maintained for local wildlife sites and local authorities need to um, honour their biodiv biodiversity duties in law, as well as achieve biodiversity net gain. But there might also be opportunities to offset the carbon footprint for your local authority with green energy production through anaerobic digestion and the energy that generates from non-fossil uh, carbon. So a criticism that's often levelled at biofuels is that their production often takes up land which would otherwise be used for food production thereby increasing food prices but of course that's not the case here when we're uh, harvesting biomass from marginal land in addition we'd be able to claim a revenue stream from the government's renewable heat incentive because we're decarbonizing our energy supply and there may also be opportunities to gain funding via biodiversity credits and to explain what I mean there, uh, in England currently, the Environment Bill includes within it a statutory uh, requirement for developers in development to uh, deliver a 10% biodiversity net gain as a result of that development. And if that can't be achieved on site as part of the development, then it needs to be offset off site. If that's the case, then that can create a market for developers to buy biodiversity credits, effectively generating funds and supplying uh, a revenue stream for landowners to manage their, their land to produce biodiversity and to maintain it for at least 30 years. 
that of course could apply in this case and could um, provide an income stream for more biodiverse verges. The potential risks of suction harvesting could lead to the damage of invertebrate populations if it's over applied. We could see the removal of seeds and the structure of uh, vegetation, uh, the removal of shelter for wildlife. And perhaps worst of all, we might stimulate a new market for AD feedstock grass cuttings, which could drive more intensive management of verges, more repeated harvesting. And it would be very difficult to see any resources being available in local authorities to regulate that new behaviour in the private sector. So how could we mitigate those risks and avoid uh, that Pandora's box scenario, if you like? Well, we'd recommend that it's it vital to establish a clear map of verge quality and therefore understand biodiversity opportunity uh, in your area, first of all. Then you can set about optimising the best management for the best stretches. Following that, you can start to mainstream better management for the rest of the network. And that can incorporate rotational management, which includes the leaving of sanctuary strips. Of course, if you're able with biodiversity credits to monetize the biodiversity through habitat banking, then that's a way of creating an incentive within a business model to maintain the biodiversity. In Lincolnshire, we um, undertook baseline surveys by running a citizen science project which recruited over 250 volunteers, organized with online maps and trained up with botanical field classes to undertake basic surveys based on just indicator species of grassland wildflowers on verges. And over six survey seasons, they were able to cover or help us to cover one third of Lincolnshire, focusing on the chalk and the limestone areas, which offered the best biodiversity opportunity for grassland wildlife. And that amounted to a coverage of some 3,900 kilometres, which led to the designation of 159 new roadside local wildlife sites, about 250 kilometres and accounting for about 100 hectares of grassland area. All of that information is now incorporated into a GIS reporting facility for the attention of utilities companies, local authorities and for strategic conservation planning as, as well as management on the ground. On the left hand side there, you can see the results map from the Life on the Verge project, as we called it. And along the western edge of that tract of limestone land running between Lincoln and Peterborough in the south is a long north south ecologically functional climate corridor for grassland wildlife in the form of the verges of Ermine Street, a Roman road. And that configuration is echoed on the right hand side there when it was used as part of a biodiversity opportunity mapping study for central Lincolnshire. At a national level, Bug Life has incorporated that same corridor into the, the bee lines that now cross our countryside. When we summarised that data set, then we found that the gold medal winners, the very best that were legally protected site quality, they accounted for only about 1% of the network. And that's where we wouldn't want to see any uh, suction flailing happen at all. We would not want to see suction flailing occur on those best stretches. On the next best parts of the network, which accounted for about 10%, these were of high biodiversity potential, restorable sites of local wildlife site quality. These potentially offer an opportunity to operate a suction flail, but only within strict protocols. The vast majority of the network though, uh, which didn't have as much biodiversity interest in its roadside grassland, offers an opportunity to increase biodiversity with suction flailing, we, we, we feel, that um, would need only observe general rules uh, uh, and would nevertheless uh, give viability to a business case for biomass harvesting. A really useful review paper was published in 2018, which asked the question, how does roadside vegetation management affect the diversity of vascular plants and invertebrates? And the conclusions it came to were that the number of um, species of plant 
increases if roadsides are mown each year rather than not mown. And when they're mown, if they're mown twice rather than once a year. And then when they're mown, when the hay is removed. So all of those measures lead to biodiversity net gain. And sadly, there, there wasn't enough data, the study concluded, for a quantitative analysis of the effects on invertebrates. But basing uh, our work on that review paper, further reading and our own experience, we've concluded that it's best for our grass and road verge wildlife if we combine management regimes into a linear mosaic with removal of the cuttings. And that term linear mosaic is something I'll illustrate in one of the next slides. We want to be able to leave a, an interval between mows of about 10 to 12 weeks, during which time there's regrowth and seed setting. And also to avoid June and early July peak invertebrate activity. We don't want to use a suction flail on the best designated verges. And we only want to harvest one in three years from hedgerow bases on wider verges, treating them as sanctuary strips. We want to avoid running machinery along verges where at all possible and reducing the size of the kit to reduce ground pressure. And ideally, we'd want to be able to carry the flail at the back verge so that we're giving, we're providing some mitigation to the risk of uh, damaging ground nesting birds, wildlife like hedgehogs uh, and, and small vertebrates. But we've also found that there's such a thing as what we call a two cut sweet spot when we look at energy recovery from biomass harvesting and biodiversity enhancement and maintenance, which could lead to a self regulating system. To explain that, basically the, the returns of energy on the energy you invest to harvest this material start to diminish after your second cut, allowing for regrowth. So if it's no longer worth your while to continue cutting after your second cut, then you won't cut more than twice a year. And because the vast majority of verges, it seems, will benefit from two cuts per year, then those two things combine into hopefully a self-regulating system, which makes sense for business and biodiversity at the same time. This diagram hopes to illustrate what a 12 week regrowth window looks like. And you can see that's a time for regrowing of biomass, but also of reflowering and of seed production and peak invertebrate activity as well. It also helps to manage uh, the vegetation height to safe levels. And this, as promised, is a, a diagram that tries to show the effects of linear mosaic cutting. And in its simplest sense, really, it tries to show a decrease in the frequency of mowing and disturbance from the carriageway edge towards the back verge or the hedgerow base. The central strip there, our potential wildflower meadow, could be mown once a year if it's not very productive, if the soil is not especially fertile, um, or it could be mown twice if it's more productive, thereby bringing it into condition, reducing the fertility and increasing its biodiversity over time. Here's an example of a sanctuary strip left at the hedgerow base as part of the haymaking process on one of our roadside nature reserves. And it's definitely worth signposting to excellent publications from Plant Life, the UK uh, plant conservation charity, which uh, lists a number of management options for maximising biodiversity on your road verges. It's fair to say that the first two rows in that table probably represent our management system of our road verge uh, nature reserves most closely. And any system that involved suction flailing for biomass harvesting would be complementary to this and would be directed more at the lower quality, lower biodiversity verges. So we were inspired by early road verge biomass harvesting trials undertaken by Montgomeryshire Wildlife Trust in 2005 and they proved that 11 tonnes of fresh weight of roadside biomass can be harvested per hectare and that those cuttings can be used for anaerobic digestion. However, they left an open question regarding the viability of the economics and the logistics. So 
picking up that baton in 2016, we borrowed this big orange beast from the Belgians who bought it from the Dutch. And in partnership with those organizations you can see listed there, we undertook trials and undertook chemical analyses of the cuttings, looking for um, the levels of chemical contaminants and analyzing other chemical properties too, and found that all were favorable for anaero anaerobic digestion. We also found that the cost to harvest that biomass from the roadside was lower than a benchmark value we might expect to receive when perhaps we would sell that to an anaerobic digestion plant for energy generation. So this provided the tantalizing prospect that we might be able to at least break even and possibly generate a profit. So in 2018, we teamed up with Scott's Precision Manufacturing in Lincolnshire, and we improved the efficiency of roadside biomass harvesting by engineering a detachable trailer, meaning that we could maximize the uptime of the harvester at the front. This led to harvests uh, in excess of 30 tonnes of fresh weight per day at a speed of between three and five kilometres per hour. Then we needed to understand well just how much harvestable verge is there in our county. So we undertook GIS or geographic information system analysis using the OS master map base layer. And we calculated that our average road verge width is quite higher, uh, quite a bit higher than the, the national average road verge width at about 3.8 metres. Nevertheless, assuming that only 50% of only the rural roads would be harvestable, we made a conservative estimate that there was about 3,500 hectares of road verge out there that we could harvest from. That accounts for half a percent of our county's area. And although that might sound small, that's equivalent to the land holding for the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. Not insignificant at all for biodiversity benefit. And when we uh, looked at likely yields, that would supply a reliable minimum yield of fresh weight of 35,000 tonnes. When we analysed the biomethane yield of the grass cuttings, we found that it outperformed maize. And with high temperature pretreatment or use of enzymes, this would enable an incorporation of this feedstock as part of as 30% of uh, the total feedstock mix. And by adjusting down an average width of road verge to two and a half meters, more realistic for the rest of the country, we estimated that around 2,500 tons of fresh weight of verge biomass should be available within 10 kilometers of any AD plant location. That we calculated would uh, save more than £7,000 for uh, an on-farm uh, AD plant in the production of feedstock itself. But when we factored in the release of land, which could be used for more profitable, uh, in more profitable ways, then that would lead to a greater than £55,000 margin of, of, uh, uh, that would be an improvement for uh, a farm business. We also noted that at the same time, there was a growing market for compress natural gas that was biomethane sourced. And you can see there a range of private sector and public sector users of CNG or compress natural gas that can all be seen as case studies on that website shown there. And from cars, vans, heavy goods vehicles and refuse collection vehicles, they're all now successfully mixing with diesel, uh, lowering the amount of fossil carbon they um, they use and in some cases reducing their carbon dioxide release by as much as 75 percent. So the methane produced by anaerobic digestion is, in, is very much in demand and in increasing demand. Also at the same time we noticed that New Holland had just released into production in 2019 the first methane powered tractor. It has carefully balanced combustion so it's lower on particulates has a 30% saving on running costs. And by running entirely on compressed biomethane, it can reduce its CO2 emissions by 80%. That offered a, a tantalizing prospect that we could even power this roadside biomass harvester with its own cuttings, making it still greener. 
At the moment, the Road Verge Biomass Harvesting Project, Batten, has been passed to Kent Wildlife Trust, who's working with the consultant, Earthcare Technical, and uh, they're um, working with the EA. Current uh, Environment Agency guidance does not allow AD residue to be used from roadsides when spread to agricultural land. So the EA have requested that Kent Wildlife Trust undertake more detailed risk assessments, more chemical tests, and more analyses of the litter contamination of roadside herbage. And, in, and over the course of this year, uh, sampling and analysis is planned by Kent Wildlife Trust. Uh, they will generate data, submit that to the EA, and the EA will then have the opportunity to establish guidance and regulations for the treatment and use of road verge uh, arisings potentially opening the door to revolutionary uh, vegetation management on a landscape scale. So the last part of, of, of this presentation, I thought I'd um, devote to public urban green space. And what I hope to do is to arm public green space managers to equip them with an argument that can call for better funding because their green spaces are all, already in so many ways so valuable for the public and for wildlife too. If we take a look at the value of urban parks, then it's been shown that the cost of physical inactivity to the UK economy is about £8.2 billion pounds per year, including £1.7 billion as a burden on the NHS and £5.4 billion for work absence. Now, based on a, a review study uh, that was commissioned by the RSPB in 2004, the economic benefits that green space can provide through its provision of physical activity can be estimated simply based on the population of people who can access that green space. So based on a number of studies, an urban park can provide 20% and let's say a three kilometre circular walk can provide 16% of total local beneficial physical activity provision. That amounts to, well, the estimates that you see at the bottom here. Per 1,000 people of population, a park can lighten the load on the NHS to the tune of uh, more than £12,000 and can boost the local economy by nearly £60,000. And a footpath can uh, reduce the burden on the NHS by nearly £10,000 and boost local economy uh, by nearly £50,000. So what value of nature in urban parks? Well, it turns out that the psychological benefits of nature increase the motivation to exercise. So where exercise is secondary to the environmental or the social benefits it, it gives, it's more sustainable, it's more habit forming. And nature needn't uh, militate against the use of those green spaces um, for uh, exercise, because it's visual access to nature that is the main motivator. So you can exercise and enjoy the view while a sanctuary remains a sanctuary. And in terms of mental ill health, that's thought to cost uh, the NHS 12.5 billion a year and 23.1 billion to the economy. And there is strong evidence in the scientific literature linking nature with a wide range of societal and mental health benefits. So if the conversation could be had in your local authority that looks at a cost benefit analysis across departments, maybe the links that are shown on the right hand side here could be made. Maybe we could argue that enhanced natural environment in our green spaces will increase the motivation to visit and use those green spaces. And as a direct result of that, we'll see improved physical and mental health. And because of that, we'll see more productive economic activity and a reduced health service burden we'll save money, and maybe that money might be available to invest in the natural enhancement of our green spaces. It's worth a try. And adding to that, increasing the value of our green spaces, um, the Park Power Project Report, published by Green Space Scotland last February, advocates the use of ground source heat pumps in urban green spaces to decarbonise the energy system with heat grids where that heat is needed most. Green Space Scotland has a new report coming very soon, building on that report, uh, which will be called Green Heat in Green Spaces. I think this is a great idea 
And I think we can actually build on it even further because those areas hosting horizontal ground source heat pump piping need to be maintained as open grassland because you, we need to prevent shading from trees and the disturbance of those heat exchange pipes by the growth of tree roots. They could be maintained as urban wildflower meadows and biomass could also be harvested for anaerobic digestion to generate further heat and power. Now we're getting into the game of what's called benefits stacking. We're increasing the range, the number and the net value of public benefits from existing public assets, which address our current climate and biodiversity crises. So let's get stacking. We can start below ground uh, with a ground sourced heat pump. And of course, that's generating heat, which reduces energy costs. And we're also eligible for the government's renewable heat incentive payments because we're decarbonizing our energy system. On top of that, we could maintain a wildflower meadow and its cuttings can go into an AD facility that could generate biomethane we could sell as a transport fuel replacement. It will generate heat, which lowers our heating bill. It will generate electricity, which we can use and what we don't use and is spare, we can sell to the national grid. And again, because we're decarbonizing our energy system, we're eligible uh, for a revenue stream via RHI payments. And when they come online in England and potentially in Scotland, biodiversity credits could now form a revenue stream as well. Then, of course, we can add on top of that, not working against the biodiversity, but complementing it, the health and well-being benefits uh, for people, the economy and the NHS, just by encouraging healthy exercising. So that's quite a stack and it might sound quite ambitious to undertake anaerobic digestion in an urban environment, but there are providers out there that can process biomass and generate combined heat and power in small modular setups, such as you can see here. And they're also very well equipped to deal with the processing of food waste. Food waste is worth a mention because in England, the Environment Bill uh, has a commitment to separate putrescible waste from landfill by rolling out separate household food waste collection nationally in England by 2023. And green space herbage, I'm told by AD experts, could provide an ideal mixing feedstock for safely regulating the biomethane yield from food waste. So it may well be that late season cut grassland is the ideal mixing feedstock as part of uh, a methane solution for our, our, our landfill in the future. I thought I'd just finish with a nod to an ancient partnership between pollinators and pollinated plants. And um, something that strengthens the argument for native wildflowers. We're looking at the product of co-evolution uh, of over 100 million years, and that really puts into stark contrast uh, how old our species is as humans. We've only been around uh, looking as we do for the last 300,000 years. So this is the product, pollinator and pollinated plant, of deep time. When we look at plants through the eyes of pollinators and insects, we see much more information that we are blind to. There are ultraviolet and near ultraviolet markings. There are fluorescing pollen and nectar. So that there is a risk that if we shape and select flora to suit our tastes and our perception, that we start to lose the key elements of our flora that give it its ecological function. And we, it will no longer be able to support uh, invertebrates, pollinators uh, and the rest of our wildlife. In fact, a study undertaken uh, by uh, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in 2004 states that since the 1960s, non-local, non-native and cultivated varieties of native British species have increasingly been used to restore and recreate habitats for conservation and amenity and landscape purposes, and that there's now a growing concern. Uh, there could be a number of negative uh, impacts on the native genetic diversity of plants with long term ecological implications. This very colourful slide shows the results from uh, a survey across four cities 
of urban wildflowers that were created from commercial seed mixes. Um, what I'd like to point out here is that along the, the, the horizontal axis is the yield of nectar per flower head. And that first group at the top, represented by the green dots, are non-native annuals. They're not performing as well in terms of yielding nectar than the next group down in blue dots, which are our native perennials. And still better are the native annual and perennial weeds that were left around the sides and colonised subsequently. So you can see that that is a strong argument for nativeness. In addition, the same study found that perennial meadows produced up to 20 times more nectar and up to six times more pollen than annuals. Those perennial meadows produced resources earlier in the year than annuals. And the early season nectar and pollen was, supply, was supplied by our native weeds, pretty much because those perennial seed mixes didn't include early flowering species like our cowslips, primrose, cuckoo flowers, violets, etc. Further nativeness in flowers and planting is a study by the RHS, which found that a greater abundance of total pollinators visited native and near native plants compared with exotic plants. So I'll conclude with the two last points that it's not all about nectar and pollen. Many invertebrates need specific native food plants. and the leaf chewers because specific species of plants support specific life stages of certain invertebrates without which the ecosystem uh, starts to experience failure and I finish as possible in keeping with local soil type and conditions this is our back garden here in Lincolnshire, turf stripped with a turf cutter, sown with a flowering lawn mix and mown once every eight weeks with a collector mower or a rake off. And isn't that better than amenity grassland where ball games aren't um, expected? You can improve access to that with a, a mown grass path, but I can promise you in the height of summer, the air was alive above it and celebrating life in all its forms. So I'll leave you with that image and I'll just uh, flash up uh, references for the recording and uh, leave you with some smiles from the biodiversity harvesting team. Thank you very much for that, Mark. We had uh, we had a little bit of trouble hearing you in the last couple of minutes there, and I don't think your last slide with the links that you had mentioned have actually popped up. Have you? Have, have we have we lost Mark again? Well, we had we had perfect reception up until the last two minutes of his presentation there, which uh, I'm glad to say that we we managed to hear most of it perfectly clearly. Um, but yeah, it appears that are you still there, Mark? I'm back. Thank you. Oh, Sorry, you. I, I, I hope we didn't lose too much of that. N no, we didn't. We literally just the last two minutes, if that. OK. Well, uh, you only missed a view of my flowering lawn, so uh, I don't know whether you got to see the uh, the, the, the flowers uh, and their nectar supply. Oh, OK. My apologies. We, 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 ne we never got to see that, but you, you did mention the last slide that was going to have a list of resources for um, for the benefit of the recording. So yes, if indeed. you do have that slide to pop up, then that would be great to finish on before I stop the recording. Absolutely. OK. There's my list of references. 